Today we're reviewing the Intel i7-13700K. We had some time to go back and pick that one up and get through the reviews process and just the short version of its specs, it ends up being kind of like a better 12900K except for less money because they have the same core counts. So Intel has brought the 13700K up to where previously you had to go to an i9 to get to that kind of core count. And that's what's going to make this one really interesting. Generationally, the 13.7 has potential to be a big jump. So we've got that. We have all the Ryzen 7000 parts in here. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Crucial, and it's DDR5 memory for Intel or AMD Ryzen CPUs. Crucial makes DDR5 kits that are deployable in Ryzen 6000 laptop systems and in Ryzen 7000 systems or Intel Alder Lake, including both budget-oriented and performance-based memory modules. If you're building a new system, click the link in the description below to learn about Crucial DDR5 memory. First of all, just to set the stage for pricing, we do basically all of our views on value. So we always consider the price and the performance and try to avoid one in a vacuum. We put together a quick pricing list of the MSRP or the recommended price or the 1K unit price is what Intel does uh, as it compares to the price retail right now when we're writing the review. And this is what that list looks like. So just for point of comparison for this review, the 13700K, we paid about 450 bucks for it, it's around 450 right now. That has it way cheaper than the 13.9, which is $660. The 13600K is $330. Then you look at AMD competition, and the closest things would be the 7700X. It's a little cheaper than a 13700K at 400. Or if you go up $100, you got the 7900X. And then otherwise, the 5800X 3D would be a pretty competitive alternative for at least gaming, and we have that in the charts. But we noticed it's been more or less out of stock, at least the places we look, although it was priced 330 to 445 before it vanished from inventory. <laughs> They've been trying to get rid of it, uh, and they haven't had much trouble getting rid of the 5800X 3D because a lot of people wanted it after those Ryzen 7000s uh, reviews went up. They were like, it was the best possible advertisement for the 5800X 3D. It was to launch a new product that was supposed to kill it. Intel's strategy with its first three 13,000 series CPUs compared to their equivalent 12,000 series counterparts has basically been to keep the same number of P cores, double the E cores, and then boost the frequency and cache. And that makes the new Intel i7-13700K with its eight P cores and eight E cores theoretically just a better version of the i9-12900K except for less money. The old i9 was $660 at launch. But this new i7 has an RCP of 420 bucks. So it's again 450 or so in reality. And that potentially makes the 13700K really interesting for hobbyists in different types of production applications, Blender, Premiere, Unreal Engine, stuff like that, as well as for gaming users. Whereas a 13.9, you're kind of more in that, uh, more or less a professional if you're buying it for production applications or just really serious about high FPS to a point where for most of us mortals, it wouldn't actually make a difference for our gaming experience. So that's kind of the split. Um, the motherboards here, Z690, as a reminder, will work. That's what we use in our testing. You can also get Z790, but Z690, if you're doing a drop-in upgrade for some reason, you could do that. But like usual, the upgrade from a 12,000 series to a 13 doesn't make a lot of sense unless you're coming from really low end, like a 12100F, and you happen to buy a good motherboard with it. Okay, enough setup. Let's get straight into the benchmarks. We'll start with gaming. Getting into gaming, in CSGO at 1080p, the Intel i7-13700K sits at 397 FPS average, with 1% and 0.1% lows in line with other Intel 13th gen CPUs. The 13700K is 9% ahead of the 13.6 in average FPS here, illustrating what the higher out-of-box frequency of 5.4 GHz can do versus the 13600K's 5.1 GHz game, at least in games like CSGO that rely more on limited thread performance. We see this again in the difference between the 13700K and the 13900K, which has a 6% lead due to the 13900K reaching up to 5.8 GHz with TVB though not worth it at around $200 more expensive, obviously. The 13700K shows a 15% uplift over the 12700KF, it's the same as the 12700K, so the generational product improvement is decent here. It's also slightly faster than the 12900K, which is the closest last-gen comparison from a spec standpoint, at least as far as core count goes. It's obviously not worth upgrading from an Alder Lake CPU to the 13700K, but maybe from something older it would be. As for AMD, AMD's 7000 series ends up mostly ahead of the 13700K. It gives up a 5% lead, 
to the similarly priced 7700X, though it's likely you could put a 13700K system together for less money. The 5800X 3D sits a lower at 342 FPS average, allowing the 13700K a 16% advantage. Moving to 1440p, the scaling is nearly identical and shows that we're still CPU bound, even with a 3090 Ti. That's a good thing for CPU testing. The data here doesn't show anything different from 1080p, so we'll just continue onward. In Far Cry 6, the Intel 13th gen sweeps the top of the chart, with the 13700K at 192 FPS average, sitting between the 13900K and 13600K in the order you would expect. The 1% and 0.1% lows show negative scaling between 13th gen parts due to the CPU hitting GPU limitations. We took a closer look at this in our 13900K review where the effect diminished when we moved to a more powerful GPU, and that was the RTX 4090. At its core, there's an issue with this game and its engine, uh, at least when you're hitting the GPU limits, not necessarily with the CPUs. The 13700K scaling over the 12700KF back to the normal chart is consistent with CSGO, with a 15% advantage. The 12700KF has dropped in price at retail these days. It's about 370 bucks now, but it's overshadowed by the 13600K at $330. AMD's best showing in Far Cry 6 is the 5800X 3D at 181 FPS average, which actually used to top this chart, but it's now functionally tied with the 13600K and gives up a narrow lead to the 13700K. The 13.7 also outperforms the AMD 7000 series, running 10% faster than the 7700X in average FPS. Intel isn't leaving any room here for AMD from a value perspective near the top of the chart. Next up is Final Fantasy XIV, using the standalone Endwalker benchmark. The 13700K recorded a 272 FPS average, which falls behind only the 13.9, and it outperforms the 13.6 by 8%. This establishes a trend of repeatable but fairly narrow scaling between the three CPUs in gaming. Generationally, the 13700K posted a 17% lead over the 12700KF, consistent with the jump between the 12900K and the 13900K. Making a direct comparison between the same core count Intel CPUs shows the 13700K with a 10% boost over the 12900K. Now, AMD lags behind here more than in some of these other tests where the 13700K defeats the 7700X by about 18%. It's ahead of the 5800X 3D even more where that one is at 218 FPS average. Of course, this is all on the benchmark. These are all completely playable, but Intel does have a, a more substantial lead here over the 7700X in this one. Our GTA 5 chart is starting to get crowded at the top, where scaling is suffering due to engine limitations. There used to be really bad frame time variants when the game bounced off that engine limit, but that's gone for the most part these days. The 13700K sits at 180 FPS average. We're at the limit here, can't see as much room as it might give, and it's tightly packed with the other 13th gen Intel CPUs as a result, just outside of variants of the 5800X 3D and 5% faster than a 7700X. Generational improvement is less pronounced here as well. The 13700K only beats the 12700KF by 9%, which is much narrower than in some of our previous games. We're getting to a point with GTA, if we've been testing GTA for a long time, it's still one of the top played games on Steam and ever. So it is still relevant in that regard, but as a benchmark, it's becoming less and less relevant because we're way up against the limit, at least for CPUs. With GT GPUs, you can still create uh, enough of a, a constraint to see the differences emerge, but we might have to retire GTA soon from the CPU test suite because it's just not enough of a range. Now for Rainbow Six Siege, which has basically become the world's leading coil wine benchmark. Companies would pay a lot of money for specialized tools that can reliably generate coil wine. And here we have Rainbow Six, which you can just buy for relatively low cost and generate as much coil wine as you want. The 13700K is at the very top of the chart and it's tied with the 13900K, indicating that we finally managed to move the bottleneck off the CPU at about 635 FPS average. We're getting to a point where we're actually just gonna need a new metric and it's gonna be a killer FPS. It's, uh, it's 0.6 kilo FPS. It's, we'll need a test with a stronger GPU to determine whether it's the GPU or the engine that's holding us back at the ultra high end for CPUs now. And that means other comparisons are the same as in our 13900K review, with the 13.7 holding a 7% lead over the 12700KF and 4% over the 7700X. Practically speaking, we're in such high FPS territory that any recent mainstream CPU more than does the job in this game. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p, we're GPU limited, so there's relatively poor scaling here. For what it's worth though, the 13700K is basically tied with the 13900K and the Ryzen 7000 CPUs, though with slightly better lows. 
We still see an improvement between generations, with the 13.7 securing 9% performance uplift over the 12700KF. Finally, we have Total Warhammer 3, which is more GPU limited without any difference between the 13700K and the 12700KF. We'll take this opportunity to remind you that if you mostly play graphically intense games like this one, especially at 1440 or 4K, you'll be fine in any situation with a modern CPU with six or more cores right now. Even quad cores like the 12100F are suitable in a lot of these situations. It gets 159 FPS average here, for example, and for the most part, the lows are okay. So really all we're saying is that if you're graphically bound, the GPU obviously remains the main issue. Next up is power consumption. So our power testing is done at the EPS 12 volt rails. We don't take total system power for this. Um, because it's not that important. What we want to do is isolate the CPU, and that's what we do. We take the CPU power before factoring in VRM efficiency losses, and for all core, we're doing this in Blender. Now, in gaming, the constant power consumption in, in Blender does not equate to what you would see in gaming, but it gives you a good peak value that you might encounter. The 13700K pulled 280 watts all core, just short of the 13900K's 295 watts, and a huge 74% higher than the 13600K. On paper, the 13.7 is just a 13.6 with two more P cores and higher frequency, but that really adds up in a load like this. The 13700K's high placement has it drawing more power than any AMD CPU on the chart, at 11% more than a 7950X and 89% more than a 7700X. If total system power under load while maintaining high throughput is important to you, consider either the 13600K or one of the Ryzen CPUs here as an alternative. Comparisons with the 12th gen have the 13700K pulling 77% more power than the 12700K and 15% more than the 12900K. And as a reminder, the 12900K has the same count of P and D cores. So this is the cost that Intel had to pay in order to squeeze more out of the 13th gen's architecture. The single core power is up next and it's representative of more lightly threaded applications. The 13700K ran at 37 watts, again between the 13900K at 44 watts and the 13600K at 30 watts. It's in line with stock frequency behavior as well. The comparable 12th gen CPUs filter in between with the 12700K at 32 watts and the 129 at 41 watts for one core. Relative to the all core chart, the Ryzen 7000 CPUs run at higher power single core due to their more aggressive boost behavior out of the box with the 13700K sitting closest to the 7700X's 35 watts. As for power efficiency, we calculate this as a simple watt hours equation where the control is the unit of work done, so one fully rendered frame in Blender versus the time and energy it takes to complete, and lower is better. Intel's 13700K doesn't look great here at 38 watt hours and it's effectively tied with the 12900K. The other 13th gen parts do more favorably, especially the 13.6 at 25% more efficient than the 13.7, likely due to the better, in this case, P core to E core ratio and also, of course, the reduced frequencies. Similarly, all of the Ryzen CPUs on this chart outdo the 13700K, with the 7700X at 23% better efficiency, which itself ties with the last gen 12700KF. The 5950X at stock is still our efficiency champion, barring any tweaking with something like Zen 4's eco mode. Now for production tests. Our first production test is Blender, where we time the completion of an in-house render using tile-based rendering to test multiple aspects of the CPU. Lower is better here. The 13700K completed the render in 8.2 minutes, and it gives up a 20% lead to the 13900K with its eight additional E cores. So they actually work here. And the advantage for the 13.7 over something else like the 13.6 is 23% versus the 6P cores on the 13600K. Generationally, the 13700K beats both the 12.9 and the 12700KF, specifically that one at 25% faster, which is better than we used to see for a single generation. The similarly priced 7700X is outdone by 31%, and you'd have to step up to the more expensive 7900X in order to match the 13700K. So that has Intel looking good here for value. For Blender, we consider the 13700K a good option for someone willing to stretch their budget up to the 450 mark because you'll be saving time in something where it really starts to add up, especially if you're rendering a lot of frames and you're using the CPU for it. But to get any more gain than that, at least a game that matters, you're spending over $200. So there's sort of diminishing returns there. 
Our Chromium code compile test is also scored in time to complete. Once again, lower is better. The 13900K comes out 20% faster than the 13700K, which itself is 19% faster than the 13.6. So similar scaling to Blender. The 7950X is the only Ryzen CPU to beat the 13700K's 44 minute time, but that's a $700 CPU. The 7700X, on the other hand, gives up a 30% advantage to the 13700K, making the 8-core Ryzen CPU an unpalatable choice for this task versus its competitors. File compression is next, tested with 7-zip and measured in millions of instructions per second, or MIPS. The 13700K again falls neatly between the 13.9 and the 13.6, each with its own performance tier. Generationally, the 13700K sits at 31% higher performance than the 12700KF, so it's actually a pretty good uplift here, and both the 7950X and 7900X outscore the 13.7, but the 7700X falls off in comparison, giving a 28% lead to the 13th Gen i7. Decompression is next, which generally gives wider scaling, but tends to favor AMD. The wider scaling shows itself with the 13700K, now leading the 13.6 by 21%, and the 13900K has 43% on top of that. The 13700K also does well against the previous generation here, outperforming the 12900K, by 8%, and of course, it's well ahead of the 12.7 also. This is a good showing within Intel's own stack. Now, as for AMD, it has a specific advantage, and that's apparent in the 7900X's positioning. The 12-core AMD CPU was 5% ahead in compression. It's now 29% ahead in decompression, a big jump. Keep this in mind if your workflow commonly includes both compression and decompression or favors the latter. And if that's the case, we'd recommend the 7900X here if you can afford the extra 100 bucks. Next up is Adobe Premiere, tested with Puget Bench to create an aggregate score built from a set of effects, filters, live playback, scrubbing, and export. The 13900K runs 4% ahead of the 13.7 here, so it's wide enough to measure but not really notice. The 13700K in turn beats the 13600K and the 12700KF by 10%. The 13700K is also tied with AMD's 7900X and the previous generation 12900K. This is the only benchmark where we saw the 13.7 and the 12.9 so close, and on paper, the new i7 is just an upgraded version of the outgoing i9. Sometimes software has specific quirks, and when we dug into the results, we found that the 12900K did particularly well in live playback, which is what raised its overall score. Our final test is Photoshop, scored in similar fashion to Premiere, and it benefits from single-core performance proportionally more than our other tests. So the extra cores still help, but not as much. The 13700K sits tightly flanked by the 13.9 and the 7900X, and it tops the 13600K by 9%. The performance gaps widen once we move down to the 12700KF, which gives up a 22% advantage to the new 13700K, and that makes for a strong generational jump from the 12th to the 13th gen. This is as high as we would recommend for someone who mixes high refresh rate gaming and Photoshop work, but maximum value still sits with the 13600K ultimately. Wrapping up then, so the 13600K still strikes us as one of the better options from Intel right now. 12100F is still awesome if you want the absolute sort of lowest entry point to a good platform that you can get and still have a, a gameable CPU. And that'll change when the 13100 or whatever it's called comes out in the future. But for now, the 13600K uh, is the best value of the Intel options that have launched recently. AMD 7000 series, still kind of in a rough spot. Prices, they, they might see some movement soon, but until they do, it's a lot harder to recommend them, especially in that 13600K competitor price class. So Intel's doing pretty well at the the 300-ish dollar mark for the 13.6. Now for the 13700K, just some quick numbers for you to recap what we talked about earlier. In, say, Final Fantasy 14, it's 8% ahead of the 13600K, 17% ahead of the 12.7, 18% uh, ahead of the 7700X. In CSGO, the 13.7 was 9% faster than the 13.6. In Blender, the 13900K had a lead of 20% over the 13.7. In Chromium, it was also 20% ahead of the 13.7. And overall, what we were really seeing is that in gaming, the 13.7 and the 13.6, 13.9, it gets really hard to justify that extra cost above the 13.600K because you're just not, I mean, again, looking at 9% gains with the 13.700K versus the 13.600K, it's definitely there and it's, it's not a bad gain. It's just that there's diminishing returns. So... Uh, we think the 13700K makes the most sense for someone who wants to couple in some production applications, as we call them. If you're doing stuff like 
uh, Adobe Suite work, you're doing heavy work in maybe Blender, compression, decompression, maybe working on Real Engine, stuff like that. It starts to make a lot more sense to get the 13700K over the 13.6. Now for AMD, the benefits mostly come out of the 7900X. The 7700X isn't as close of a competitor as probably it needs to be to pull away the recommendation from the 13700K, even with the slight price disparity there. So 7900X is the one you'd want to look at, but it's not always in the most defensible position either, depending on which benchmark you're looking at. So uh, overall, the 13700K, we think it's in a good spot generationally. It's had some actual real gains. Uh, it has supplanted the 12900K, so they've gone, they've taken an i9, they've basically turned it into an i7, and the price is better. So that's that's all good. Uh, it's just the question of diminishing returns is worth it for you or not. But as a CPU, it did pretty well in our testing. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly, and we'll see you all next time.